Our scripture reading this morning will be number or <laughs> number will be uh, from Matthew the thirteenth chapter, verses one through three, and then we'll drop down and read ten through seventeen. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version. That day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea, and a large crowd gathered to him. So he uh, got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And he spoke to them. uh, He spoke many things to them in parables. And the disciples came to him. uh, Jump down to 10 now. And the disciples came to him and said to him, Why? Do you speak to them in parables? Jesus answered them, uh, To you it has been given or granted uh, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But to those who do not have, even What he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing, they do not see, and while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecies, prophecy of uh, Isaiah is being filled, uh, which says, you will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. For the heart of the people has become dull. With their eyes, they scarcely hear. I mean, with their ears, they scarcely hear. And they have closed their eyes otherwise they would see with their eyes they would hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and I would heal them but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear for I truly say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. From a far off land, neither here nor there, I bring you the fable of the tortoise and the hare. Hare was very conceited and thought that he was the most handsome animal in all of the forest. He would often gaze into his mirror and say, I am so handsome. Look at my lovely ears, my pretty pink nose, and my beautiful buck teeth. He also thought that he was the fastest animal in all of the forest. One day Hare overheard a group of turtles talking. They said, Cousin Turtle has never lost a race. He always wins. Ha! scoffed Hare. We'll see about that. He marched over to the group of turtles and said, Everyone knows that I am the fastest animal in all of the forest. Tell your cousin Tortoise that I challenge him to a race. The next day, Tortoise met Hare in the clearing. He said, Hello, I am Tortoise. Are you ready to race? Hare answered with a laugh, of course I am, because I am the fastest animal in all of the forest. Tortoise and Hare lined up. Raccoon held her tail up in the air and said, on your mark, get set, go. Hare took off and left Tortoise in a cloud of dust. Meanwhile, Tortoise never wavered from the race. He kept on going at a steady pace. Hare looked behind and saw that he was far ahead of Tortoise. He decided he had time for a little break. So he stopped by the side of the road and pulled out his mirror. 
He said, just look at me, so handsome, not a hair out of place. As Hare admired himself, he saw another reflection in the mirror. It was Tortoise. You see, Tortoise never wavered from the race. He kept on going at a steady pace. Hare yelled, oh no, I got to go. And he took off faster than a speeding bullet. Again, Hare looked behind and saw that he was way ahead of Tortoise. He decided that he had time for a little snack, so he stopped by the side of the road and ate a belly full of the abundant greens growing there. Now tired from all he ate, he sleepily looked up and saw Tortoise. You see, Tortoise never wavered from the race. He kept on going at a steady pace. Hare yelled, oh no, I gotta go, and he took off faster than a tornado. Hare ran for a while, then he looked behind and saw that he was way, way ahead of Tortoise. There was no sign of Tortoise at all. Hare decided that he had time for a little nap. He sat down by the side of the road under the shade of a small tree and began to snooze. Meanwhile, Tortoise never wavered from the race. He kept on going at a steady pace, and Tortoise passed the hare. Hare woke up just in time to see Tortoise approaching the finish line. Hare yelled, oh no, I gotta go! And he took off faster than lightning, but it was too late. Although Hare was close behind, Tortoise crossed the finish line. You see, Tortoise never wavered from the race. He kept on going at a steady pace. About 600 years before Jesus Christ was born, a very famous Greek storyteller by the name of Aesop told that story. And Aesop was known for his many fables and is known centuries later for hundreds of stories that he told, but not stories just to be told. They were stories told to teach a lesson. They were stories told with a purpose. And such is the case of Jesus and his parables. And this morning, that we're going to take a look at just that very topic here. We're going to talk about the purpose of parables. I hope you have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 13. That is our text this morning. If you notice from Jim's reading a moment ago, we jumped from the first three verses down to verses 10 through 17. And that's because we're going to pick up that part that we left off in next week's lesson. But in Matthew chapter 13, in the first three verses, we see Jesus coming out of a house. This house was probably located on the, the edge of the Sea of Galilee in a, in a town called Capernaum. And Jesus had a multitude of people who often would gather around him. And on this occasion, he decided to get into a boat and go out just a little way from the shore and he sat down in that boat, and as the crowd of people gathered on the shoreline to listen to what he said, he started to teach them. Now, Jesus had taught them many things before, but now we start to see something that is very new. He starts to teach them, in verse 3, in parables. What is a parable? Is it simply a story, or is it something more? Vine's Expository Dictionary of Biblical Words defines a parable as a placing beside, to throw or lay beside, to compare. It signifies a placing of one thing beside another with a view to comparison. Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary defines a parable as a short, simple story designed to communicate a spiritual truth, a religious principle, or a moral lesson, a figure of speech in which a truth is illustrated by comparison or an example drawn from everyday experiences. Albert Barnes wrote in his commentary that the word parable is derived from a Greek word signifying to compare together and denotes a similitude taken from a natural object to illustrate a spiritual or moral subject. It is a narrative of some fictitious or real event 
in order to illustrate more clearly some truth that the speaker wishes to communicate. In early ages, it was much used. Pagan writers, as Aesop, often employed it. And in the time of Christ, it was in common use. The prophets had used it, and Christ employed it often in teaching his disciples. Now we realize that people like Aesop told fables which were an early form of a parable to communicate a purpose. And we realize very clearly that Jesus taught in parables. The New Testament and especially the gospel accounts are filled with these stories with a purpose. But did you realize what Mr. Barnes just mentioned that other people in the Bible also used parables. They also used stories that were laid alongside a truth to better help the hearer understand the message that was being presented. Let me give you an example. Hold your place in Matthew and turn, if you will, back in the Old Testament to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 12. I think we all remember the story of King David and Bathsheba. King David saw a woman by the name of Bathsheba bathing one day and he looked upon her with a lustful heart. And he desired her for himself, although she was the wife of another man. He took her into his bedchamber and he committed adultery with her. And to add insult to his injury, she was found to be with child. Rather than acknowledging his sin, rather than repenting to Bathsheba, to her husband, and to God in heaven above, David tried to hide the truth. He did so by sending Uriah the Hittite, her husband, to the front lines, and he was there killed. And then he took Bathsheba in to be his own wife as if that would make everything go away. But in 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting in verse 1 and reading down through verse 7, the Lord sends a prophet by the name of Nathan to David. And he sends this prophet to communicate a message to him. And isn't it interesting that the prophet Nathan chose to tell a parable in order to communicate this prophet to a man who was not acknowledging the truth, but was rather trying to hide it. Listen to what we read. The Lord sent Nathan to David and he came to him and said, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Now, did you understand Aesop's fable earlier? Did you understand the moral of the story? Did you understand the meaning behind the tortoise and the hare? If you keep on keeping on, if you continue down a steady pace, that you can ultimately cross the finish line and even be the winner? I think Aesop's hearers understood, and centuries later, we understand. Now the question is, does David understand? Does David understand the meaning behind the story? Well, in part. In part he does. Because when he hears about a rich man who has plenty of animals to sacrifice, to eat, to share with his visitor, but rather than taking his own, he takes the one ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man. David gets part of the message. Because in verse 5 we read that David's anger burned greatly against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. Yes, David understood part of the meaning 
behind the story. He understood that it was not right for the rich man to, to take from the poor man to, to uh, ignore his own abundance and to rob a man of what little he had. He understood that. He understood that there were consequences that needed to be carried out. He even calls on the man beyond restitution. He says he ought to die. But who was the rich man in the story? In verse 7, Nathan said to David, You are the man. You are the man. You are this rich man who stole from the poor man because here you are, the king of Israel. You're at the, the top of the heap, the cream of the crop. You're it. You're the man. You have the power. You have the glory. You have the riches. And you have taken Uriah's wife, something that did not belong to you, something you had no right to take, you took his wife and sent him to his death. When the parable was explained, did David understand? If you look at verse 13, David said to Nathan, not how dare you come and preach to me, how dare you come and tell me this message? How dare you confront me with these allegations? David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I see the meaning behind your story. I see the purpose of your parable. It's to help me to not live in a lie but to own up to the truth. Back in Matthew chapter 13, as Jesus begins these parables, and in chapter 13, he's going to tell seven different parables. But as we jump down to verse 10 of chapter 13, the disciples come to him and ask him a real simple question. Maybe a question that you were asking earlier in this sermon. Why is Kevin telling us the story of the tortoise and the hare? This is supposed to be a worship service. This is supposed to be a time when we, when we talk about the Bible, and I don't remember that story being in there. Maybe Jesus' disciples are wondering, why are you telling stories? Why aren't you just preaching the truth? Why aren't you just quoting Scripture? They come to Jesus and ask him this question, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answers in verse 13 by saying, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. In Luke 8.10 he calls those the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But he says, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. Now this is not Jesus saying, I want you to know the truth and I don't want them to know the truth. This is saying you understand something that they don't. Now Jesus went from place to place and was surrounded by, by multitudes, but they were probably multitudes from the local area. And so when he was in Judea, he probably had crowds from Judea. When he was in Galilee, he probably had crowds from Galilee. And so when he traveled from place to place, he might have had different groups of people who were hearing different portions of his message, but his disciples were always with him. They traveled with him. They saw how he acted and how he reacted. They heard what he said. They witnessed the demonstrations of his power. And what he's simply saying to them is, you are getting something, you're hearing something, you're seeing something, and you're understanding something that they're not. And so I'm going to do all that I can to help them. In verse 12, Jesus talks about the difference between these disciples and these crowds. He talks about the difference between the haves and the have-nots. And he says in verse 12, For whoever has, to him more shall be given and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Now I want you to think about this. The disciples had it. And he says, to you more will be given. Because you have had me in your midst, 
and you've understood what I was saying. These people have me in their midst, but they do not understand what I'm saying. And I'm going to teach them in any way possible and in every way that's necessary to help them to understand what I'm saying before I am gone and they've lost it all. In verse 13, he says, Therefore, I speak to them in parables. I tell these stories. I lay these tales alongside the truth that they're not getting by themselves. I'm laying it alongside that truth so that they'll get it. So that they'll understand like we understand the story of the tortoise and the hare. Like David understood the story told to him by Nathan. I'm going to lay it alongside so that they'll understand. I speak to them in parables, verse 13, because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. He goes on to say, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing but will not understand. You will keep on seeing but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. Do you realize what this is all about? It's all about Jesus' purpose. To come to this world to seek and to save those who are lost. And He's going to do everything that He can to do that. How many times have I preached a sermon and as much as I prepare, as much as I plan, maybe I am in the middle of a sermon and I'm teaching something, I'm preaching something and in my own head, based upon some glossy stares that are coming back at me, maybe I'm thinking, Kevin, you are not getting this point across at all. You're not doing a very good job. Uh, you need to back up a little bit. You need to take a different tact. Uh, maybe what you need to do is, in, instead of just focusing on it from this perspective, maybe you need to focus on it from another perspective, and maybe that will make the story clear. How many times have I taught a Bible class, and, and again, I think that I'm communicating the, the Scriptures in, in, in a good way, but yet somebody raises their hand and says, Kevin, I don't understand that. I, I don't get that. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not getting what you're saying. That's what Jesus is describing here. Not a people who necessarily don't want to know the truth, but they are not understanding that truth like his disciples were who traveled with him all of the time and who perhaps had a greater understanding, a greater depth of knowledge, maybe even a greater spiritual maturity because of all that they had witnessed. So Jesus is going to tell a parable. In verses 14 and 15, when he quotes the Old Testament, he's quoting Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. But Mark chapter 4 helps us maybe to understand this as Mark records in verses 33 and 34 of Mark 4. With many such parables, he was speaking the word to them so far as they were able to hear it. And he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. His disciples may have understood deeper truths, but the multitudes needed these stories. Their understanding was much simpler, not as far reaching. And so he told them these parables and Mark says he didn't tell them anything without a parable because they needed these comparisons. They needed these stories laid alongside the truth to see how to connect the dots to the truth. And Mark says that he's using parables to teach the Word. Do you remember what Matthew said earlier? Those parables were being told so that they would understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven like the disciples or the kingdom of God as Luke would describe it. What do we mean? What mystery are we talking about? Well, the Apostle Paul wrote about the mystery 
on several occasions. And I want you to turn in the book, to the book of Ephesians and I want to read along with you the explanation that Paul gives to the church at Ephesus concerning the revelation of this mystery. In Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3 verses 1 through 10, Ephesians chapter 3 verses 1 through 10, the Apostle Paul writes the following. He says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of the Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation, listen to this, there was made known to me the mystery. So whatever was a mystery has been made known to Paul. What is it that has been revealed to him? As I wrote before in grief, in brief, he says in verse 4, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, okay? Now we're getting somewhere. This mystery involves Jesus, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are now our fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now we're getting somewhere. This mystery of Christ has been made manifest in the church. This mystery of Christ has been made manifest in the idea that as Jesus lived and died and was buried in a tomb and rose again, we who live in sin can die to that sin, be buried in the waters of baptism, and rise to walk in newness of life as members of the body of Christ, the church of Christ. And he says, this has been revealed not just to the Jews who are under the law of Moses, but now to the Gentiles under the law of Christ as well. He goes on to say of this gospel, he says, of which I was made a minister. Verse 7, according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me, according to the working of His power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in heavenly places. Think about the people in the Old Testament. They were looking forward to a Messiah, but did they have any idea they would get Jesus? They were looking for an earthly king, not a spiritual king. They were looking for somebody who was rich and powerful with a military, an earthly physical army at his disposal. What they got was the poor son of a carpenter. Think about the church. The Old Testament, they talked about the coming of a kingdom. What did they expect there? Probably some kind of vast empire who would be able to destroy the armies to the north, the armies to the south, that could take out the Roman Empire who oppressed the Jews so very strongly. What did they get? They got the church. A kingdom, but one that was spiritual. Now these mysteries are being made known to us. And now we understand in the light what to so many of them was darkness before. You see, we can lay alongside some of the New Testament teachings to the Old Testament teachings, and now some of those things make sense. They certainly make better sense to us than in some of the limited ways they understand it, understood it of old. Jesus would continue to say back in Matthew 13, verses 16 and 17, He would say to His disciples, Blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. Now, remember, the eyes and ears of Peter, Andrew, James, and John work just as well as the eyes and ears of the people who are present. But what He's talking about is, Blessed are you who have ears and you listen and you understand. Blessed are you who have eyes because you see and you get it. You understand what's going on. You understand who is before you and the words that he is teaching. Verse 17 reads, For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Turn, if you will, in your Bibles to 1 Peter. 
1 Peter chapter 1. I want you to consider what this apostle, this disciple of Christ Peter wrote to the first century church in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 10 through 16. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 10 through 16. Peter writes, as to this salvation, this salvation that we have as members of the body of Christ, as to those who have been baptized into the Lord, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. Therefore prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Do you get what he's saying? Listen. See. Use your ears. Use your eyes. Become a part of the kingdom and serve the king. These mysteries have been made known to us. They have been revealed to us. But don't just understand it. Now he's saying also do it. Don't just listen to the word and say, okay, I get it. Now do something about it. Be holy, he says, as I am holy understand the meaning of the message and then live it. A small mouse crept up to a sleeping lion. The mouse admired the lion's ears, his long whiskers, and his great mane. Since he's sleeping, thought the mouse, he'll never suspect that I'm here. With that, the little mouse climbed up onto the lion's tail, ran across its back, slid down its leg, and jumped off its paw. The lion awoke and quickly caught the mouse between its claws. Please, said the mouse, let me go and I'll come back and help you someday. The lion laughed. You are so small. How could you ever help me? The lion laughed so hard that he had to hold his belly. The mouse jumped to freedom and ran until he was far, far away. The next day, two hunters came to the jungle. They went to the lion's lair. They set a huge rope snare. And when the lion came home that night, he stepped into the trap. He roared. He struggled. But he could not pull himself free. The mouse heard the lion's pitiful roar and came back to help him. The mouse eyed the trap and noticed that one thick rope held it all together. He began nibbling and nibbling until the rope broke. The lion was then able to shake off the rope that held him so tight and stood up free again. The lion turned to the mouse and said, Dear friend, I was foolish to ridicule you're being so small. You helped me by saving my life after all. Aesop's fable of the mouse and the lion tells a good story as well. Never underestimate that which is small and the power that it has. And I wonder sometimes, especially in Matthew 13, as we get into seven of these parables, one big parable, the parable of the sower, but a few others that are only a, a verse long. I wonder if we'll look at these stories and say, well, you know, those are nice, but they're really not as powerful as the book of Acts, the book of Romans, 1 Corinthians. I wonder if we diminish these stories 
maybe like a fable of old. And we don't see the power in the Word. This is when the Lord calls upon us who have ears to listen, to we who have eyes to see, to listen up, to pay attention so that we can understand how He can explain so very simply the powerful mysteries of God's Word. And I want to say one final thing in comparison uh, to help us maybe. Let us not only realize that with these stories can we understand God's Word, but perhaps we can use these stories and parables like them to help, under, to help others understand sometimes difficult passages, sometimes tough texts that maybe are not just as obvious to us as some of the stories we've read. Maybe we can step back, take a different tact, approach it from a different perspective, from a story that can be very simply laid alongside a truth and can help bring someone to salvation. That's the message for us. And that's the lesson for us as we understand the purpose of Jesus' parables. This morning, if you're not a child of God, Jesus has very clearly and very simply laid out a plan whereby you might become a member of the family of God and be saved in that eternal home called heaven. He has asked us to study the Word of God, to study it, to, to understand it, to know it, and then to obey it. We put the Word of God into practice with our faith, not just believing with all of our heart in the will of God for our lives that's recorded for us in the, the Bible, but by living the Word of God, by repenting of our sins, by confessing with our mouth what we believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and being baptized by immersion in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to have our sins washed away and to walk in newness of life. If you're not a child of God, I hope you understand the simplicity of the message as to how to be saved and to be a part of the Lord's church. And if you are a member of that body, if you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, I hope you understand the simplicity of what's expected of you. You're everything. You're everything. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Not just a mental love, but an outward expression of that faith by living every day for the one who gave his life for you. If there is someone here who is in need this morning of our prayers, if there is someone who is in need of encouragement or help, as you also are appealing to God to grow in the grace and knowledge of His wonderful Son. If we can help you in any way, I hope this morning you get that message that we want to and we're ready to while together we stand and sing.